Awesome. Thank you, Canvas. Yeah, um, hi, John. Yeah, nice to uh, uh, meet you online. Uh, it's been a while. Um, yeah, buddy. I guess we should uh, start off with a quick um, intro. So yeah. um, uh, do you want to go first, John, your uh, experience around Cassandra? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I first got started with Cassandra about 10 years ago, uh, putting it in production version 1.1. Uh, I think I was the first person to use CQL in, in production. Uh, ended up going to Datastax for a little while. I was a technical evangelist. That's where we met. And uh, after that, I, I went to the last pickle, did consulting for uh, a few years, went to Apple, uh, worked on the Cassandra 4 upgrade uh, while at Apple. Uh, I spent the last year and a half at Netflix, and now here I am uh, back consulting, uh, this time for myself, um, and just helping people with all sorts of Cassandra issues. How about you? What are you up to? Oh, th 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 thanks, John. Uh, that's a, a great intro. Um, and uh, yeah, I just got to say to everyone that John's got this amazing experience around Cassandra. He's seen one of the, some of the biggest clusters around the world. You know, uh, he should be bigging himself up a bit more, uh, in my <laughs> opinion. Um, and, uh, just for, for myself, software engineering background, uh, moved on to DevOps and um, came across Cassandra in 2009, uh, put it out there in production um, and um, joined Datastax for a little while where I went out and set up my own company, consultancy and managed services co company around Cassandra. And uh, we built a tooling um, around Apache Cassandra called Axonops. And um, I'm one of the co-founders. Yeah. All right. With yeah. that, um, let's move on to the five steps for rock yeah. solid Apache Cassandra. Yeah, man. Let's dig John, in. Do yeah, let's dig in. I like it. All right. Absolutely. Um, so there are potentially, you know, a lot of steps that, that someone could break these things down into, but these are kind of like the, the, the core things that, that we want you to get out of it is, is these five steps here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, infrastructure assessment and, and kind of give you a ballpark and what your hardware should look like and help you kind of understand like uh, your hard, just how hardware requirements in general. Um, talk a little bit about configuration. This is, this is super important. Um, understanding how your uh, operating system, your, your applications are configured or, or you know, we're not talking about like minor changes in, uh, in application behavior. Some of these things can have huge impact. Um, and then of course that leads to observability. Like how do we actually determine um, if we're using our hardware correctly or if something's misconfigured or, or not tuned correctly. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about automation um, along with some examples on, on things that, that you can automate, why you should automate. Uh, I may even share a story about um, what happens when you don't automate and, and things go wrong. Uh, and of course, we're going to be uh, touching on security because this is uh, super important, absolutely critical, uh, especially when you have a, a you know, system like Cassandra, which can go across multiple data centers. You might not necessarily be, just be dealing with private network. Um, you know, pretty, pretty important stuff. All right, thanks, anything John. To add? So, Did I miss anything on there? No, no, that, that, that's uh, perfect, John. And um, I, I'd say uh, we're going to talk about security first, um, and I'm going to move on to the. Um, oh, actually, uh, we 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 need to talk about why people are using Cassandra. I mean, one of the main reasons, um, John, that um, you know, big enterprises and corporations, some tech companies, are using Cassandra out there. Yeah, there's there's a few good reasons. It turns out. Uh, to start out, I mean, one of the things that the like, absolutely necessary. Uh, security, uh, you know, I just mentioned it, uh, super important, right? You can't have a database uh, if, if it isn't, if you're not able to lock it down and, and know that things are going to be working properly and people aren't just going to be logging in, you know, that's not great. Um, I think the the core thing about Cassandra that, that people really kind of latch on to uh, is its resilience. Um, you know, I already mentioned multiple data centers, being able to run in multiple data centers across multiple continents to be able to withstand like network partitions and to be able to basically make the choice uh, between do you want to have availability versus consistency, that is an incredibly powerful tool that that other databases really don't offer. There, there's there, there's very few options when it comes to to that type of um, you know if you have those like uptime requirements. Um, on the performance side, this is a this is a thing that I'm 
really, really passionate about. If anyone has seen anything that I've, I've written in the past or videos that, that I've, I've made, uh, I'm a big performance guy. Like I, I'm going to, we're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, Cassandra it has his incredible performance. If you, if you know a few things that, that, uh, you need to set, um, out of the box, it, it, it's deceptive in the way that it performs. And if you, uh, know what you're going to, if you know what you need to tune, it, it can be absolutely incredible. Uh, in the, the community, uh, is another great reason. So the community is, is probably one of the major reasons why I didn't just get involved in Cassandra, but stayed involved in Cassandra is because there, there was such a good community. I, back when we were on, uh, the, the community used IRC for everything. Like I met a ton of people through IRC, um, made a whole bunch of friends in the community and, and it ended up being spectacular. Uh, and of course, you know, it, it is proven. Um, Cassandra is being used in some of the biggest database deployments in the world. Apple has something around 200,000 nodes. Uh, Netflix is running tens of thousands of nodes. Uh, and there's other companies that are running, you know, thousands of nodes. Like there's, banks are using it, uh, insurance, oil and gas, energy sector, like everybody is running Cassandra at this point. So it's, it's amazing tech uh, and it just keeps getting better. Um, is, did, did I miss anything? I mean, I, I feel like I sold it. Uh, I, I hyped it up kind of a lot. Uh, did I miss anything there? No, 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 that, that's um, absolutely perfect. And, you know, and as you mentioned, some of the big, biggest tech companies are using uh, Cassandra. That speaks for itself, right? So, uh, you, know, I w you know, we've been involved with some of these kind of large uh, companies and large deployments with Cassandra. And, you know, they, this uh, tech just works. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something I've, um, I, I did when I first started using Cassandra and um, back in 2009, we set up a, like a small office uh, a set of PCs simulating WAN and, and then putting power cables out just to test the resiliency. And I was just gobsmacked, right? Yeah. And uh, that's why I just fell in love with Cassandra technology at the time and deployed this into production without telling my boss and then uh, apologized later. So, um, that's a sort of uh, technology that is. So, mm -hmm. all yeah, right. I, I did. I did something similar. I was just deleting data files. I was like, "Huh, keeps working. That's weird." <laughs> <laughs> That's it. So, um, let's talk about um, security. Um, so, um, what are some of the? You know, this is one of the steps in implementing a rock solid Cassandra cluster. So, you know, what are the things that uh, you know uh, you can do with Cassandra? Yeah. Um, these are these these are interesting and, and uh, there are also things that are best done up front. I'm gonna I'm gonna just say right now that if uh, if you're thinking about getting a Cassandra, if you're thinking about using Cassandra, this is definitely something that, that you want to do up front. It's a lot easier to set it correctly in the first place than it is to change it later on. Uh, when especially since we're talking about like you know point number one here is encryption. Like we have inner node encryption, like with do the Cassandra nodes communicating to each other. And then we have from your application to Cassandra itself to the driver. So you want that needs to be encrypted as well. Um, it's getting the uh, driver to talk to Cassandra and switch to encrypted. That's not the hardest thing in the world. Getting into node communication set up afterwards, not the hardest thing in the world, but it is a little error prone and you do need to be kind of careful. It means that you have to like deal with a whole, like probably either a run book or you need to build some automation to help you out. Uh, it's just not something that's fun to do. So you, you definitely want to get this set up first. Um, then of course, there's there's the authentication authorization, right? That, that's kind of like standard database stuff. Uh, best practice is to make sure that you're always using uh, authorization and authentication to make sure that you know people are connecting to your database that you actually want to be connecting. Uh, and of course, audits, right? Like we need to be able to go back in time and have the ability to take a look at what's happened, uh, see who's connected, see what's See, you know, see what's going on, uh, get a little bit more information. So, so we know that, that in the past, you know, something happened or didn't happen. Um, is there anything you want to add to this? I know, I know we had a, uh, we, we talked a little bit about some of the aspects of SSL, uh, when, when we talked earlier, Hayato. Yeah. I mean, um, SSL is obviously, you know, very, very important TLS, TLS version 1.2 plus is the kind of default, uh, for these days now. But I'm just going to go back to a little bit about the authentication authorization. Now, authentication, you're thinking about, you know, the, the database drivers connecting to the uh, database or, you know, even users with a you know, browser accessing the database. 
now you, you've got to have the right roles and permissions and so on. But um, it's um, the, the, the later versions of Cassandra, the latest versions of Cassandra now have a feature that uh, internode connectivity. They, they can also have authentication um, enabled as well. So this is something that you need to think about. Um, the other side of things is audit, um, as uh, John mentioned. This is actually a quite uh, new feature in the latest versions of Cassandra as well. We always crave for this feature in the open source Cassandra in the past. Uh, because the enterprise always have to have the DML, DCL, and DDL type of audits um, in, in the logs. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's now native to the later versions of Cassandra, so do enable those. But yeah, in terms of SSLs, you know, it's um, something that you have to, um, you should implement, um, and, and but there are some implications around that. And um, I've come across um, a, a customer once, and um, they'd have let the SSL ex uh, uh, certificate expire. And uh, they, they, you know, I had to actually go into the Cassandra code and modify the code in order to ignore the uh, expiry and things in order to fix this cluster. Because if you restart that node, it can't join the other nodes anymore because of the ex certificate expiry, right? So things like that, whoops. Um, so, I, I, you know, thing, uh, those kind of things should be monitored. So I'm just going to show you like a you know, service health check whereby you've got a uh, you know, service um, uh, like SSL certificate expiring on Cassandra checks. Um, so, um, you know, it would, you should have these kind of uh, monitoring in place as to when, when your SSL certificates about to expire and so on. Yeah, but that's definitely not a... Uh... A fun surprise, especially since I, I, I found in the past that these types of problems, um, very rarely do you just go ahead and do a rolling restart for the sake of a rolling restart. Uh, you know, like, I think that maybe you end up doing, J, you start doing JVM tuning, right? And then you do a restart and then it can't connect to the rest of the cluster and you're trying to figure out like what, why can't this thing connect? And you know, our brains, because we sat there and we just did JVM tuning, we're thinking to ourselves, well, it must be this, right? What else? There's nothing else that changed. Well, it turns out that the certificate expired. So if you don't know where to look and you, and you don't think about it, it's really easy to, to, to just not notice it and, and not be aware of the fact that that, that happened. Uh, and, and these types of things can chew up a lot of time because they're, they're not obvious. It's weird sometimes. And you're just like, okay, like, what, what is going on here? So Usually, you know, then now you've got two problems, right? You're trying to do your JVM tuning and now you've got this emergency certificate uh, situation. So um, yeah, you definitely want to stay on that. that that's a, the, you, have, you, have to, you have to know when your certificates are expiring. All right. So yeah, that's, uh, uh, let's go back a few slides. Sorry <clears> about that. And let's um, go back into the slideshow. All right, uh, I think that's um, you know a good takeaway there, John. So um, I'm going to move on to the next um, step, one of the five steps. So uh, infrastructure assessment. Yeah, uh, this is really important for databases, right? Remarkably important. Uh, yeah, databases tend tend to stress hardware resources quite a bit. Um, this is this is pretty interesting, especially on the Cassandra side of things, because. Um, you know, I, I've worked in a few in a few places where where teams have just kind of been given hardware and they don't really know. They either don't know what it can do or they're or it might not be optimal for the Cassandra deployment. Um, if you have the, you know, the option, like if you have the ability to, to kind of determine what kind of hardware you're getting up front, you're going to be a lot happier. Um, Cassandra doesn't need or really perform that great when you, as CPUs scale up. If you're sitting there and you throw 64 CPUs at Cassandra, it's not actually going to take advantage of them that well. You'd rather have small, multiple smaller boxes than try and do vertical scaling. And your money actually goes a lot further when you do that anyway. Um, and it's the same thing with memory, right? You don't you don't necessarily need 500, uh, you know, a terabyte of, of memory on a box. You you really just want to make sure you have enough memory for the JVM and to satisfy your reads out of cache. Um, the, the, better, the better your cache hit rate, the faster your responses are gonna be and the, and the, the better scale you get out of the machine because you're gonna do less IO. Um, and you know, on the topic of IO, that's where we've got storage. Um, the, the last uh, 
the last couple of decades have seen huge advancements in, in storage. Uh, nobody deploys spinning disks anymore. There's, there's no point, they're horribly slow. Uh, at a minimum now, now we're talking solid state drives and really everybody now is shifting to NVMe drives. And NVMe drives, uh, Hayato, I know you've, you've worked with these two. They're absolutely phenomenal. Like when you can get two gigs a second of throughput at 100 microsecond P99 latency out of, out of, uh, out of your storage, it completely removes it as the bottleneck uh, for a database. Like it, 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 it's absolutely amazing. Um, you, I, I know that you had uh, something that you wanted to show on this. Do you want to talk about this for a minute? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think um, you know the standard size um, of um, a, a Cassandra that you might be wanting to put in. You know, um, generally speaking, in production databases, you're talking about minimum of eight cores, uh, and then uh, possibly max, absolutely maximum of thirty-two cores. One of the things about the um, um, the, um, the, the, the 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 aspects uh, of this, and uh, you have issues. Um, if you've got way too many cores uh, um, and you can't leverage them, right? So, but um, yeah, so one of the is like, this is a kind of the uh, cluster. Um, I, I, think, I think we're uh, screen share. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, my machine is freezing, um, unfortunately. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're breaking up a little bit though. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. Oh no. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Um, I just see you right now. All right, okay. This latest uh, release of uh, Zoom has been quite problematic. Um, let's um, try and share again. There we go, share. How's that, can you see? Yep, we're at infrastructure assessment. All right, okay. I'll just stay on the on the slide for a minute then. So yeah, um, so I, I've come across like uh, you know customers whereby they bought this really expensive kit, and uh, you know when you're deploying a large cluster, it does cost quite a uh, a lot, you know, um, and yeah, essentially they were le leveraging about two percent of the CPU, but they bought this expensive kit just in case. So yeah, I think uh, one one of the things that you need to do is you know benchmark. Um, your your hardware um, before committing to spending a lot of money. Now, obviously, cloud makes it a bit easier because you can change the instance types fairly quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it, it's you still need to kind of you know benchmark whatever hardware you've got. Now, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, benchmarking tools, John? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, the one I think the thing that that uh, if we're going to talk about one, because because typically the thing that, that we benchmark is storage, right? Um, this is this is probably the the most one of the most useful tools that I've ever used. It's called FIO. Uh, you can you can develop uh, you can write configuration files for it to simulate basically any any workload, and it's actually the used to benchmark the I/O subsystem with Linux kernel. Uh, this is it's a very like very mature excellent tool. Um, and this is what I use across, like whenever I'm setting up new hardware or new environment, um, so if I'm not familiar with an environment and, you know, I start taking a look at it, I like to get an idea of what the hardware is actually capable of. Um, I think typically people, people have a little bit of a disconnect between what's actually going on on the, the hardware level, the resource level, and they tend to kind of blame hardware when, when they don't actually know what the capacity is or, or how to measure, um, like what what the, what it's actually doing. So, uh, bringing in benchmarking to your your hardware is super important. Um, and you know you you want to benchmark every step along the way, which is why we say benchmark everything. Uh, you you want to benchmark your hardware, then you want to benchmark the database, then you want to benchmark your application. How all those things integrate? Like you can think of it as layers of benchmarking. Um, and getting getting each of those is really important because you'll never really understand what your hardware is capable of 
if you start with application level benchmarking, because it won't, it probably won't stress your hardware out all the way. So it's important to do that first. Um, on the network we've got side, a question there, from, um, oh, yeah. sorry, uh, John, we've got a question from Pedro uh, asking about uh, the, the recommended benchmarking tool. Um, yeah. So they can write it down. Yeah. yeah, it's called uh, FIO. Um, and it'll be in one of the slides at the end. We, we, we put a link to it, but it's, um, I'll type it. F I. Yep, there it is. Thank you guys. Yeah. Look at that community. Everyone's involved. Um, the uh, F I O is an incredibly useful tool. So I, I, I've developed uh, some configs for it, which would actually simulate Cassandra. So they'll they'll have like random I O readers, like configurable number of readers, and then uh, sequential uh, readers and writers to simulate compaction. Uh, it, it's pretty cool. Like you can you can do a lot with it. And then when you start actually running a database and you look at the numbers, you're like, oh, okay. Like I see how these are relative to what it can do. Um, on the network side, we, we didn't really touch on this yet a lot. I won't go into super detail, but iPerf has been a really, really useful tool for um, testing out networks. Uh, if you want to know what your throughput and latency you're, you're getting on a network, especially if you're looking at a WAN, uh, really, really important. Because I think a lot of people, um, tend to underestimate how long it actually takes data to move from DC to DC. And, and, and they think things are, are completely instant, but in, in reality, everything's not perfect. The network isn't that reliable. Uh, so it's a really good idea to test this stuff out ahead of time before, before you get into trouble. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I've come across like a Cassandra cluster has been deployed on one gig network. And it's fine for most uh, circumstances, but when you're restoring from the backups or when you're repairing a node, um, you know, from other nodes, you know, the, the bandwidth becomes a bottleneck. So mm -hmm. it's a, it does help to have that extra bandwidth, uh, you know, at, at restoration times and so on, right? So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, the other thing I've seen is like, uh, you know, a Cassandra cluster being deployed uh, on a VM kit with a SAM backend. And uh, there was one instance where it was quite recently, um, this cluster was, well, uh, deployed. They benchmarked one VM and said the hardware is fast enough, but the uh, cluster just did not perform well with the IO. And it turns out that the IO um, SAM backend had a bottleneck with all the Cassandra reading and writing from it. Now I said to them, did you run the ben benchmarking on all the nodes at the same time? And the, obviously the question, uh, the the answer was no. And uh, yeah, it turns out to be the, the problem. So SAN can always be you know, a, a problem uh, with um, with um, Cassandra as well. Yep. I, I just I just recently ran into some SAN questions. Uh, a, a team a team was using a SAN and, and basically the similar uh, type issue. No, there wasn't any benchmarking done. There was there were, there was no numbers whatsoever and um, you know, it was a giant question. It was like, what can this do? Do we need to expand? Do we not? Like what, you know, there's, there's a couple other issues at play. There's GC issues and, and some misconfiguration and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, you know, it can be, it can be tricky if you don't know how to look at your hardware and understand what it's doing. Um, you're, you're basically just throwing darts with your eyes closed. Like it's really, really hard to, to get it right. Uh, if you don't know how to measure it, which actually brings us to our next topic, I believe. Indeedy. So configuration yeah. planning. Yeah, so um, yeah, there's a, there's quite a lot around configurations that uh, we'd like to talk about. And, uh, you know, uh, John and I have uh, gone through many, many different iterations of configurations with our customers. And, uh, you know, uh, from our experience, you know, uh, some of these kind of points we're making here uh, applies. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, Cassandra configurations. Yeah, and this is this is a this is unfortunately uh, this can be tricky. There's a lot of of configuration uh, tunables that that exist in Cassandra. Knowing which ones to tune can be really hard. Um, it's especially tricky since Cassandra effectively ships with with configs that are really good. If you're going to be developing, try and develop Cassandra, make changes to Cassandra, and you want to develop it on your laptop. They're they're uh, at the most, it's going to give you, um, you know, uh, like enough throughput where where you're not going to completely lock up your machine. But you know, you bring these to production, 
And, you know, we were talking about Cassandra performance. Like I've done a ton of Cassandra performance tuning and the number of times I've seen the, the stock config put into production and not take full advantage of the hardware. It, it, it's like almost every prod, it's almost every, uh, uh, you know, cluster I've ever had to look at that has the same problems. Um, so it, it, it's, it's the Cassandra configs aren't meant for prod. Um, the, some of the OS settings that, that come out of the box, like if you just install Ubuntu, um, you're going to get a few settings in there, which aren't optimized at all. They're actually terrible for Cassandra. And the biggest one is read ahead. Uh, read ahead will go ahead and, and effectively you issue a, a read to your disk. Read ahead grabs way more data than you need. So by default, it's set to 128K. So any read operation that you do to your disk is going to pull uh, extra data. This is called read amplification. And uh, it can be a problem. Like you, you can act, like, let's suppose you only need 4K off disk or 1K. Like, why do you need to read 128? So you end up reading so much more off your disk and you end up actually fully utilizing your disk, but you're not actually like doing anything with that data. You're just churning it through, bringing it into memory for, for no reason. Um, the JVM configurations, like Cassandra, um, I believe we, we, we just fixed this recently, but um, in, in 4.1, but Cassandra used to, for the longest time, shipped with JVM settings that were not great at all. Um, the, the new gen would be, so it used par new and CMS with a really small new gen, which caused frequent GC pauses. Uh, and then those GC pauses would end up taking a long time because there's lots of memory that had to be copied around. And, and it ends up being kind of this like, just terrible um, experience. And you, you don't want that. You, you want to, you want definitely want to just use G1 GC, give it as much memory as you can up to 31 uh, gigs and, and, you know, it's, it works out much better. Um, Cassandra configurations themselves. I mean, we, we were just talking about this, uh, like the, the concurrency options in the Cassandra config. Um, can, can, I think you have something you can show us uh, where, where the defaults are, right, with this? Yeah, yeah, let me see if I can uh, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, my, my um, Zoom is working again. Um, so let's take a, a look at look at a, one of the Cassandra configurations. And uh, this is what contain, what's what's in Cassandra YAML file, by the way, just a um, representative on, on the nice tabular form. I'm just going to type concurrency and it, uh, concurrent, sorry, concurrent. So there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, um, uh, concurrency based uh, parameters in here and by default um, they are only suitable for your development environment right where you're not going to put much load onto and um, and um, look, most people forget to change these uh, parameters and what happens is they're pushing a lot of load onto Cassandra but because you've got these um, you know thread pool sizes set to quite low values for development purposes you're not leveraging the hardware so they, you might have bought an expensive kit and then your CPU like, utilization is not going high. Um, well, uh, it's because you haven't let Cassandra to do, to do so. So things like concurrent writes, concurrent reads, you know, there's native transport, max concurrent connections, or um, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, parameters that uh, you need to kind of um, change production. And as uh, we said in the slide, defaults are bad, right? So. Have, have you seen these kind of um, occurrences, John? Everywhere. This is 100% of the clusters I've worked on. Like, you know, like I said, people are just putting uh, the, the YAML in production without without realizing it. And it's an easy mistake to make. I mean, everybody does it. That was my that was my first my first cluster I put into production. I used the defaults. That's that's how we figured out that the JVM settings didn't didn't really work. Um, I even have blog posts um with a fellow committer Blake Eggleston that go back almost 10 years talking about how to optimize uh par new and CMS for read heavy workloads uh Cassandra uh was you know it was an 8150 I think was was old Jira that like moved to G1 GC people were talking about it for forever it's been a it's, it's a contentious topic uh changing any config it, it becomes um difficult because it's you know how do you make sure that you're not not um tanking someone's performance and, and, and at the cost at the benefit of improving someone else's. So um, 
yeah, go, going through and making sure that, that these numbers actually make sense, having a process to understand like what the difference is when you make a change, super important. And that, that's where like we start talking about uh, observability, right? That, that's kind of, that, that leads us into that like bigger observability discussion as to how you can tell whether the changes that you're making in your config are actually having the, the expected, um, you know, the, the expected change that, that you're looking for. Um, one last thing that, that I wanted to bring up that, that um, uh, we had in here was uh, table configurations. So uh, I talked a little bit about read ahead and how it will go ahead and, and, and just pull data off disk for you. Um, so, you know, in the broad category of read amplification, there's also a table level configuration uh, that, that matters to you. Um, so when you do a, a sh like when you describe your schema, you'll see uh, with compression equals, and then you'll see the, the compression class and the chunk length in KB. Now the chunk length in KB is the size of a buffer that gets filled up with data compressed and then written to disk along with some other metadata. Whenever you need to do a read, it has to uh, read, read in that whole chunk and decompress it. So you can, by default, for the longest time, Cassandra shipped with 64 KB chunk length. So no matter what, you always have to read that whole chunk. So again, my example from before, if you only need 1K of data, 4K, 2K, whatever, you still have to deserialize that whole thing. So there's a lot of overhead associated with that. So what I found, which is really interesting to me, I, and you know, I, 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 I've been sharing this uh, with, with everyone that, that will listen, um, read ahead in, improper, like the, the default read ahead setting with the default compression setting, fixing those two things on a lot of workloads, will, can, you can get a 10x improvement in throughput and latency. Um, you do a little bit of decent JVM tuning and, and a, like the improvement to a cluster's performance can be absolutely remarkable. And that directly translates to cost. Like people, I think when people hear performance tuning, they assume that I'm, I'm trying to get us from 10 milliseconds latency to eight milliseconds latency. I've had instances where we've talked about hundreds of milliseconds of latency down to single digit milliseconds latency. It's that big of a deal. You, you go from storing 200 gigs of data per node to a terabyte or two terabytes of data per node. And now we're talking about a humongous cost reduction. So for me, you know, looking, looking at uh, like proper configuration and doing performance tuning, the thing that we want to get out of this is huge cost savings and being woken up in the middle of the night less frequently. Thanks, John. Yeah. So, yeah. One, uh, one, no, one thing, one takeaway from here is that uh, the the defaults are bad, right? And uh, and I do kind of uh, go through them, and uh, you know, just take uh, take away these recommendations, like uh, you know, the screen ahead and compression of chunk size makes huge difference to your performance. All right, the next slide is uh, about uh, my favorite topic, which is um, observability. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, John, you know, um, what, what, do you, uh, what do you say about observability? Oh, uh, I love observability. This is, this is actually one of my favorite topics. Um, and observability is interesting, right? It's, it's one of those things where um, the, the idea of just having dashboards, I think sometimes people, they say we have dashboards, therefore we have observability. And it, it, it's not quite right. Like, like you're not like just having them doesn't mean anything. Being able to interpret the information, being able to build a mental model, and get a proper understanding of what hap what's happening, starting with your hardware uh, to Cassandra to the application, really, really, really important, right? Like it's like you don't just measure one thing and then determine e the result of of you know everything that's going on based on one measurement. You have to have these in the same way that we talked about benchmarking. Uh, having layers, observability has layers. Um, so it, it's really important to understand what your hardware is doing. That's like, when it comes to um, trying to do a performance analysis, the first thing that you want to do is understand what your hardware is actually doing. So in the same way that we benchmarked it before using like FIO, um, here, when we're looking at hardware, um, you know, we want to, we want to be able to, to take a look at what the latency is, what the throughput is of, of the underlying storage. Um, and we want to have a methodology that we follow to build that mental model in our head of, of what the hardware is actually doing. So this is where I usually recommend 
uh, Brendan Gregg's use method. This is, it stands for, um, it, basically the deal is for any given aspect of your hardware, you can look at the utilization. So that's the percentage use, so zero to 100. Uh, saturation, is there a queue on it? So are there requests sitting in, the, in your device, like your storage queue to, to be, um, you know, before it actually gets submitted to the device itself? And the error rate, because it doesn't matter if you're getting P99, 100 microsecond latency, if 80% of your requests are errors, like that's, that's not useful. And I have actually seen that uh, before. Um, you, your old kernel with the NVMe drives, turns out like, you know, it, it didn't really behave correctly. And so the team had NVMe on, on uh, Cassandra on NVMe drives and the performance was terrible. And that's because they were using an old kernel version. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're, we're not just talking about like, let's look at the hardware. We actually want to see uh, warnings and errors and be able to correlate those to, to the different events that happen. So you need a nice system to be able to like search within periods of time. And that, that's where we like, that's where I like Elastic or Open Search uh, mixed with Kibana. And that's, you know, that's open source. It's fantastic. Um, you, you have to have all your logs aggregated and you have to have them, um, you have to pre-built like searches ideally so that you know, like you're not, you don't want to have to think too much about the problem. Like, how do I get the information that I need to solve the problem? You want it presented to you right there. So you're literally just putting information in your brain. Um, and then, you know, one, one of the things that, that I have found is that it's not enough just to have dashboards, right? Like usually if something's going wrong, we identify a node that's, that's a problem. And that's where you need to, um, I don't know about, about you Hayato, but like for me, I have to keep my brain in either programmer mode or like sysadmin mode. And when you start talking about observability and like what's going on in, in like the Linux kernel and like thinking about latency, like you need to be in sysadmin mode. Uh, people that, that if you try and force a programmer mindset on this, uh, it, it can be problematic because the sysadmin knows to like use the right tools. To sysadmin will use, you know, IO stats, take a look at the, the IO um, what's happening in IO in the background, MP stats, look at multi-processor stuff and, and new, like the newest tools that are incredibly useful. And I really want to stress these is uh, BCC tools. Um, this uses the BPF uh, kernel uh, uh, machinery and, and, and it, you can get a ton of really, really interesting information about what your device latency looks like at a block level. You can get slow file system access. You can watch every file operation. Um, absolutely uh, amazing tooling. And uh, these have these have really changed the way that I've worked because I've been able to spot issues that I, I hadn't before. Um, to put it to, and then I'll, I'll be honest with you, I have one thing that that has been my, uh, I'm not gonna say the, the secret sauce because I'm, I'm pretty public about it, um, flame graphs. I have, I have found that when it comes to understanding because what's going on with uh, any system and any, any database or any application, um, I usually reach for the async Java profiler and pull up a CPU flame graph. Um, that's going to take CPU samples of, of the stacks of what's going on and, and give you a nice uh, visualization as to what, uh, where the CPU is spending its time. And if you haven't made any configuration changes, uh, and, and you haven't tuned compression, for example, you're going to see that compression is spending a, a ton of time in CPU. And uh, I think we have a, a flame graph that we can show just, just to get an idea of the, the visuals here. Um, do you mind uh, bringing that up? Yeah. I'm... There you go. So I'm yeah. So when, when you run into a performance problem, this is, is my go-to right now. Like I, I'll run this over 30 seconds or a minute. Um, and you look for the big bar and the big bar tells you where the time is. Like it, it a lot of the time it's, it's that easy um, to, to fix some of these issues or, or to be able to at least confirm your suspicions about stuff. Cause I think like with compression, a lot of folks are, they'll say, how do I know that compression is really the problem, right? It's not enough to show that, that they're doing a lot of IO. Right, you need you need to actually be able to say, hey, like I can, you know, demonstrably show you because you're going to make this change and it's going to cause Cassandra to rewrite every, you know, we're going to rewrite every SS table 
that's a lot. Like that, that's kind of a, that's a lot to ask of somebody um, to make that change. So this, this helps gives you the, the, the insight that you need in order to do, uh, to do the job. Um, Hayato, what you, I think we had, um, what do we have here? Yeah. I mean, there are amazing set of open source tools out there, you know, like uh, Grafana from Prometheus uh, to capture a lot of the system and Cassandra JDM metrics. And, um, and um, as well as you know, you're talking about the Elk stack, Elastic Log stash, Kibana stack in order to capture the events and logs. So these are sort of things that you need, you need to do. I mean, uh, you know, at um, um, Axonops, I guess, uh, you know, we have... Um, the commercial kind of our, uh, tooling is, is um, you know, putting all of those kind of tools together into a single pane of glass. So we have laid out, you know, a very um, curated uh, set of dashboards for people to be able to analyze the, the um, platform and how they're performing. And, uh, you know, you, you, should, you, you can identify where, where, where the problems are. And I was showing one of the charts to John and he said, oh, I wish I had that. Um, to solve this problem, uh, you know, one, one of the things is uh, is uh, this chart, and uh, John, uh, you know, what was the issue you had, uh, you know, recently? Yeah, th it, this is a uh, I, I love I absolutely love this. Uh, I was working with a team, and um, they basically in the middle of the night at some point, like load would would just appear out of nowhere. Like they have a, a huge spike in requests and. They weren't sure where it was coming from. And unfortunately, the right monitoring wasn't in place. And if you don't have the monitoring in place up front, like there's not really a great way of going back and retroactively figuring out like where the traffic came from. So then, then it's like, okay, like what do we do? Do we, does it happen every night? Does it like, what if it doesn't? Like who is, who is running this job? How do we track it down? What, or what are they up to? Um, so you can tell like what table or key space something is writing to, but in my case, I was dealing with a multi-tenant cluster with hundreds of tables and dozens of teams all using the same, like the same set of data. Uh, I, I generally, as a best practice, tell people not to do that. I don't like having everybody connecting to the same thing. It makes it really hard to understand, but in this case, that decision is already done. So we're sitting there going like, okay, like we got a lot of reads from this table, but there's a lot of folks doing a lot of reads from this table. Going back, like we had no way to, to determine where it was coming from. What's, um, so how does this, how, so this, this would help us, this here would have been amazing. Being able to track down, look at IPs in the past where that traffic came from, that would have saved us an, an incredible amount of time. It was such a headache. Yeah, yeah. Um, these kind of information is available inside Cassandra. You just need to extract it out and present it in a way that's easy to kind of understand. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, what we've done for our, our users out there. I'm yeah. um, just a little bit conscious of, uh, of the time, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, topic, uh, which is the automation. Again, another one of my favorite topics. John, you got um, any, any um, key takeaways for the automation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love automation. Um, the so the reason why we put the, so automation is important going from the the first thing that you do all the way to the the end. If you can automate everything, like that's kind of the utopia, right? Going from like if we're talking cloud provisioning, do you want somebody to go into the AWS console and like click around? to get you a new Cassandra box and hope that they did it with all the right settings? Or do you wanna have tooling like Terraform or, or home, uh, home written tooling that will properly like get you the right, the right instances, it can look for spot instances, uh, it attaches the right drives with the right settings, with, with everything the, the, the way that you want. You want your, your infrastructure to be uh, homogenous, it has to be all the same or else it's really hard to figure out when things go wrong. And it's the same thing with, with config management. And, you know, I think a lot of folks will, will you know, be familiar with tools like Puppet, uh, Ansible, things like that. The, the, um, but what I've found is that there's actually a lot of teams that will manually manage config files. So I, I recently worked with a team that had several hundred nodes and they, like when they wanted to make a change, they actually had a change ticket and someone would go in and, and go node by node and, and make the change. And sometimes they missed things and sometimes you know, like the, the nodes would be different. Um, 
it, it was problematic. You definitely don't want to, your configs to be wildly insistent. You have to have that stuff be uh, managed for you. And it's the same thing with, with your actual operations, like repairs. Um, people used to put repair on cron and you'd run into weird like race conditions and timing issues. Now, if you want to, uh, if you want to manage repair and you're like, you want to do it through open source Reaper, that that's a tool that we, uh, when I was at the last pickle, we adopted from Spotify. They had written it originally and Reaper is amazing for, for managing repairs for you. Um, it won't, uh, it will make sure that it doesn't repair them too aggressively. It'll repair small chunks over time. It's really great. Uh, and I know, I know Axon Ops has, has a, a something similar. Um, can you can you pull that up? Can you show that to us? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we're talking about uh, you know automation, repairs, and backups. So, repairs wise, um, you know, it's you just really don't want to be kind of dealing with uh, repairs if you don't have to. Um, you know, there, there are well proven methods of repairing Cassandra clusters now, as John was talking about, uh, Reaper, the open source tooling that came out of Spotify. I actually was, uh, used to visit Spotify office on consulting Cassandra uh, databases um, that they had. And they told me they developed this Reaper tool. It was actually, uh, uh, what, why, uh, I said, why is it called Reaper? I said, oh, it's because um, it was a Swedish pronunciation of repair. Uh, that uh, was mis uh, misheard by some, an English person, and then uh, it got uh, uh, made, uh, named as Reaper. Uh, so that's a bit of a fun uh, knowledge there uh, for you guys. Um, anyway, the yeah. So uh, you know, repair can be quite invasive to your Cassandra clusters because it's comparing data across all of your nodes. So this is something that uh, you know you, but you still have to do this. And um, so adaptive repair in Axonops takes care of that very gently without affecting the performance of your Cassandra cluster and uh, slowly repairs across your tables um, in, in a scheduled way. And it also uh, is detecting if your cluster's been busy or um, it's, it's free to do more repair work. So it uh, speeds up and slows down accordingly. So yeah. it throttles the, the, the repair process automatically for you. Yeah, this, so the, the thing I like about the adaptive repair is if if you if you think about the like uh, the, the work that a cluster is going to do, it's never it typically isn't constant. There's always spikes. There's always valleys. And trying to plot your repairs around those around those spikes and valleys manually is really hard, especially if folks are deploying new things. Like I put a new like I just talked about this random thing that just appeared that that we weren't expecting. Um, you know if that happens at the same time a repair is running. Uh, a really aggressive repair schedule combined with like a huge workload at the same time can can really harm a cluster. Like it can it results in a lot more allocations, which causes more GC pauses, more longer GC pauses, and then you add a, a big workload on top of that. Now you're basically fighting for resources. I, I really really like the the model where you don't have to think about um, you know when repair is running. It just runs when it can. Like when it can be fit in, it's almost like cooperative multitasking. It's like, okay, like the, the workload on the cluster is dropped. Now we'll do the repair. And, and to me that from a, again, from a performance standpoint, it's nice because you need the repair done, but you don't necessarily need it done this minute. It can be any time over the course of today. Same again with backups as well. You know, databases have to be backed up. Yeah. Um, and I've seen so many people who don't back up databases and uh, came across uh, a specific customer who didn't back up and run the cleanup script against the production database and they lost all their data. And um, I actually kind of helped out uh, looking through the actual file system, trying to recover deleted files. That was an interesting challenge mm -hmm. there. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, you don't want to get to that situation. So always yeah. back up your data uh, and you know automate it. There are many tools out there. Medusa is a great open source tool. Axonops have got uh, you know, a graphical way of managing your backups and restores and so on. So do automate your backup process. Yeah, and, and the thing, one thing to remember is that backups aren't just about uh, like environmental catastrophes, right? I think, I think that it's really kind of easy to, to think about backups as being like, well, you know, if, if the data center disappears in a tornado, then I need a backup, but that's 
that's really not a lot of what we have backups for. Like there's very few complete DC destruction events that happen now. Uh, DCs are fairly reliable that way, but there are a lot of like mistakes where, um, you know, you type something in, let's say, uh, you know, from personal history, uh, before I got involved with Cassandra, I was working on a, a database upgrade and I was SSH into a whole bunch. Actually, it was, it was every production database and my local all in tabs and iTerm. And I did send to all tabs and where you type in one tab and the same command goes everywhere. And then I did an, uh, you know, a few minutes later, I did an RM RF star locally because I had some files that I wanted to get rid of. Guess what? I deleted all the production data files from every single production database. Like, like just idiotic, right? Like, like the moment you do it, my stomach dropped and I was like, Oh, this is bad. And for like, fortunately I had a backup, like I hadn't tested the strategy. So at that point I had to figure it out. I wish I had automated the, the restore. Um, and this is super, super important, right? When we talk about automated operations and reporting, like automating backups, you have to automate the restore too. Because when, like from personal experience, I will say, I'll tell you when you need to do a restore, that is not the time to be figuring out how do I do a restore? Like that needs to be like done ahead of time. You need to practice it. You should ideally be restoring from one cluster to another, like for, let's say you have uh, load tests that you want to run. It's a really great use for backup restore there, selectively doing it through tables. I know, um, I, I think you were showing me Axon Ops can do individual table restores and backups, right? That's right, yeah. And so, um, you know, um, you um, go to restore and you can see a history of all the um, backups. Um, you click on one and one of those guys, pick a node and then pick a table and then do your restore. Yeah. So it's as easy as that. Yeah, this this would have definitely saved. I, I would have much preferred to have that restore uh, than when I was like, now how do I do restores? <laughs> Figuring it out on the fly. That was that was scary. <laughs> it's really a afraid that day. Yeah. That, that's why we built it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, I think we're getting towards the end of the session, and I guess uh, we can, you know, talk about uh, the summary and takeaway. So we did talk about, you know, that the hardware selection. Yeah, uh, we talked benchmark your kit, uh, update your default settings because generally the default settings are not optimized. Linux kernel or Linux is, uh, you know, uh, the, the ones you do download from the internet is designed for general workload. Yeah. Cassandra, you download is for your development environment. You do need to fix those. Implement monitoring, absolutely. You know, it will help you diagnose issues in the middle of the night when the problems always seem to happen and you get woken up and you with your blurry eyes, you need to be able to identify issues very quickly. Automation, yeah, um, repairs, the backups, the configuration management, they need to be done as to, to make your um, Cassandra platforms rock solid and security, right? You've got to secure data. It's got to be sitting in the deepest, darkest corner of your data center, right? Nobody's allowed to touch it and it's encrypted uh, and so on. So yep. secure your data. All right. Yeah, love it. Look at us on time, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so this last little bit of info, I think some of the links to the tools that we were talking about uh, are here. I believe the slides are going to be shared, but feel free to take the screenshot. Um, and um, yeah, so anything else, John? Our, our contact details are there too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we just, I think um, we just got Q&A. And hand over to Candice um, from Linux Foundation. Thank you so much, Hayato and John, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day. So we have some questions.